There are many different types of trusses on the market. They differ in the number of main cords, the cross sections of the tubes, the material, the alloys, the way how the connector looks like, um, the sizes and ultimately in internal functionality which depends on their design. Therefore, I will now talk about so-called Virendil girders. But before you watch this video, you should watch the two how does truss work videos to understand the forces you can find in a usual space frame or framework. I explained in those videos that there are only compressive or tensile forces in a framework, which is why the cross sections of the diagonals can be kept relatively small, slim and thin. But first I should clarify what a Virendil girder is and where this odd name comes from. The name of this beam type comes from the Belgian civil engineer Arthur Virendil, who developed this principle in 1896. And the difference between a space frame and a Virendil girder is quite simple. The beam does not consist of triangles, but rectangles. You can see the differences on this truss. You see the pattern of diagonal bracings, which forms triangles. All components are stressed strictly by compressive and tensile forces. How this principle exactly works from a static point of view, I already explained in the video how truss works. From the bottom you can see the main cords and the cross members. To show how this structure deals with bending and lateral force, I will use again a foam model. You can see the main cords and perpendicular to them, in a 90 degree angle, the cross members. What happens to a single span beam that is loaded by itself weight? To clearly demonstrate this effect on this foam model, the cross members are intentionally thinner than the main cords. To show that properly, I first need two supports for my foam model. And what could serve better than these two boxes of good Czech beer to support my beam? You can see that the cross members are deformed since the 90 degree angle has the tendency to become smaller or larger. Smaller here in the top corner, larger in the bottom corner. Here in the center it is still 90 degree. The bending of the bars is the visible result of the internally occurring bending moments within the cross members. These bending moments require larger and thus stiffer cross sections. For this reason, the cross members on actual truss are also thicker than the diagonals used in the sidewalls. These thicker tubes are also suitable for assembly of lighting fixtures, for example. Therefore, I also have a model where the cross members are as thick as the main cords. This makes the entire beam stiffer and therefore stronger. Now you can see the differences in less deflection of the entire beam and less deformation of the cross members. This type of truss, for example, includes both design principles. The vertical sides include diagonal bracings, meaning it is designed as a framework made of triangles. A vertical load serves for compression in the upper cord. The lower cord is subject to tension. The shear force generates alternating compressive and tensile forces throughout the diagonal bracings. The bottom side is designed like a Virendil girder. The behavior previously shown on the foam model is achieved with a horizontal load. To better show this behavior under a horizontal load, I must twist the truss once. If a bending load is applied in this direction, compressive and tensile forces occur in the main cords. This is like the classic framework. But in addition, there are bending moments in the main cords and cross members. Let's now assume this kind of truss is used in a roof structure, for example. To show that properly, we have to change our setup. Due to the dead weight of the truss and the payloads placed on it, there is of course a bend downwards. If a wind load is captured by any kind of cladding, the truss is also bent horizontally. So there's a combination 
of bending around both the vertical and the horizontal axis. With a design that is provided with diagonals on all four sides, it's relatively easy to convert the external load into compressive and tensile forces in the main cords and diagonals. But if the truss is designed in the style of a Virendil girder, as in the case with this example, more extensive verification is required in order to take local bending stresses into account. It is important to mention that it is wrong to say that a truss designed like a Virendil girder cannot accommodate any horizontal bending at all. The verification of the horizontal load is only mathematically more complex than if it were designed like a framework truss. A structural engineer must therefore be consulted to answer this question in each individual case. So that's it about Virendil girders. Cheers!